Hello, um, are we on here? Is this microphone working? Can you, can you all hear me clearly? Yes, okay, great. Um, Alan, if you can make a presentation. This lady at the back of the room in the corner, if you just want to speak with her, that would be great. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Robert Heyman. I'm the uh, manager of events and acting manager of capacity development and training at the CTO. The CTO is the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. And, and for those of you that don't know the CTO, we're a membership organization, intergovernmental, and uh, we work in the field of ICTs, delivering support to our members that are Commonwealth governments, regulators, and we have some ICT sector companies such as Facebook and Huawei within our membership as well. Um, now, um, I'm very happy to be here and chair this session. <laughs> it's my first time chairing a session, so I'll try and speak clearly for you all. I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers um, soon, but uh, before I do that, I'm just going to give a quick summary of um, this uh, session and, and what we're trying to achieve from it. So um, I'm just going to read the description, session description so we can all have an idea of what we're going to be discussing. So. The session is data privacy and protection, um, and the description is ICT co um, continues to advance at a rapid rate and is providing a foundation for economic development. While countries are working towards creating digital societies, there is an urgent need to ensure the protection of data by implementing appropriate legal frameworks and raising awareness on this. The entry into force of the EU General Data Protection Regulations and its global impact also underscores the need for countries to pay attention to this issue. For many Commonwealth countries, especially developing countries, there exists no or inadequate legislation to address data protection. And for those countries which have legislation, it may only be partially enacted at some states, uh, sorry, as some states grapple with establishing the necessary institutional structures to give effect to the laws. At a recent Commonwealth data forum that we, the CTO held in February 2018 in Gibraltar, which was hosted by the government of Gibraltar, issues highlighted included pressing individual and collaborative priorities and where inevitably limited resor resource should be channeled, sorry, and where inevitably limited resource should be channeled. Enduring themes emerged, including the importance of learning from each other via rich and frequent dialogue, such as this, and information sharing, the pivotal role of education in this data space and identifying and capturing risk. So um, this session proposes to serve as a platform to provide information on making data protection laws relevant for the digital age, uh, to raise awareness of the impact of GDPR on Commonwealth member states, and to discuss the challenges faced in drafting and implementing data protection laws with a view towards overcoming these challenges through sharing uh, good practices and facilitating partnerships to build the required capacity. So, um, I am very pleased to be joined by Alan Kappa. Uh, Kappa. Now, Alan is the senior policy officer at the international, uh, sorry, he's, sorry, he's Alan is the senior policy officer, uh, international engagements at the information commissioner's office, um, which is of the UK um, of great, uh, government um, of great, great Britain and Northern Ireland. And um, we, we, along, alongside Alan, we have uh, Professor Mona al uh, Jabbar. Jabour. Jabour. I did try and learn Arabic a couple of years ago. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, professor of Law um, and um, uh, PM of Information Security Panel. Uh, I am a permanent member. A of permanent member, right. Information Security Panel at the Russian Regional Summit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mona. And, and she also is the head of the Lebanese Information Technology Association um, and is a member of an, and a member founder of the Pan Arab uh, Observatory for Cybersecurity. And we've brought um, Mona in because of she's an expert in uh, data, uh, data law. And I, I listened to a discussion um, earlier uh, yesterday where she contributed to that discussion. Um, and uh, we think we can learn from, from her experience. We also have Eleanor Plexida. Um, sorry if I pronounced that cor incorrectly, Eleanor. <laughs> Government and um, uh, IGOs and Engagement Senior Director at ICANN. And she's also joined with, uh, by her colleague, Teresa Swinehart. And uh, Teresa is the Senior Vice President multi-stakeholder strategy and strategic initiatives at ICANN. Um, so you can share um, your experiences uh, uh, from, from the ICANN's perspective. And, and then we're also looking at um, the member states and what um, our members are doing in this particular area. And we am, I'm pleased to say we have Mary Aduma. Mary is the managing director of 
Jano Digital Solutions, um, and but she, you know Mary from uh, a lot of other um, things that she's worked within uh, in the in, the, in the, the, the the wider ICT community. She represents the Republic of Nigeria, and we also have Sally Anetta. Sally Anetta is obviously um, um, Sally Anetta oh. <laughs> Tamanikai Wamaro. <laughs> Sorry, uh, founder and executive director, uh, um, Pacif Pacifica ne Nexus, and president of the South Pacific Computer Society, the Republic of Fiji. So um, that was a mouthful, um, but I'm glad we've got to, the, to, to that, so we can introduce the, the first speaker now. It's going to be Alan giving an overview of GDPR, what it means, um, and a lot, a lot of us know what that means already, but it's um, what's um, going on in the Commonwealth, and he's going to be also talking um, as a member of the Common Thread Network. So I will let you... Continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Just a, a precision. Um, the ICO, the Internet Information Commission's Office, is, a, is an independent regulator, so we don't, we're not part of the government. Oh, sorry, so yeah, I, I realised that mistake we when I said decision, that. Whenever we make a we can make decisions against yeah. the government. Is a, there's an issue with uh, or they handle data or they furnish information to, to the public. Absolutely. Um, well, you mentioned that um, th there was a sort of an overview on, on GDPR, and I think uh, since the 25th of May, I think everybody knows about the GDPR, so I, I, don't, I won't try and expand on that too much. Uh, I think my presentation today will try and capture so the, the outcome of the GDPR, so what it means for a jurisdiction outside, well, outside Europe, for instance, uh, because the scope of the, the regulation has dramatically changed since the, the Directive of 1995. Um, but I'll come to that in a moment. So, um, as you know, the internet and digitalization are fundamentally changing the way. Sorry. Oh, so oh, sorry. Can I do sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hear myself Claude and now, so it's good. Um, so, I was about to say is that the, the internet obviously has, has changed the way people in businesses uh, as well as government interact. Uh, this has led to a new phase of globalization underpinned by the movement of data across national borders, uh, changing nature pattern and actors in uh, international trade in goods and services. And by this, are, uh, it's also having an unprecedented impact on global business and GDP of, uh, of, of the states. Um, as recent reports have shown, like McKinsey in 2016, the, the movement of data is already su surpassing uh, traditional f physical trade as a connective tissue in the global economy. Uh, the geography of uh, globalization of data flows is also changing within the developing world. Uh, today, more than half of all the international trades in goods involve at least one developing country, and trade in goods between developed countries, or so-called source trade, grew for, from 7% to 18% from to, to the year 2000 to the year 2016. But what does it mean? So, well, um, those data flow offer huge opportunities for uh, economic growth, obviously, and empowerment for, of citizens to take control of all their data are, are being used. But um, this development also presents new challenges for governments and privacy re regulators like the ICO to ensure that those opportunities are used but not abused. And obviously I refer here with the uh, recent campaign Genetica, um, which uh, you might have seen in the press. But from um, an economic perspective, data protection is directly related to trade in goods and services in the digital economy. Insufficient protection can create negative effects um, by reducing uh, consumer confidence, and overly stringent protection can obviously uh, uh, unduly restrict uh, businesses in, in the way they interact with each other. Um, and obviously that adverse um, economic effect has, uh, as obviously a, a big result on businesses themselves, but also on the economies. Um, for corporates and governments, ensuring that law consider the global nature and scope of the application and foster com com compatibility with other framework is of utmost importance for global trade flows that incredibly rely on the internet. Um, moving away from the economic and the uh, consumer arguments. Um, Trust Online also addresses issues related, relating to democratic governance, ethics, and for many jurisdictions, the fundamental rights of the individual. Um, concern relating to the online provision of search, communication, health, education, retail, and financial services rely or, or could lead to the massive or, and undiscerned collection of personal data, as well as the absence of control of individuals on the decisions they are made on, on, the, on their behalf. Um, and the global nature of internet also means that data can be quickly and easily transferred to third party in other jurisdictions uh, where we could safeguards apply. 
This transfer can undermine domestic privacy goals, which in turn can prompt domestic regulators to limit the free flow of data across borders. This is what, for instance, happened in October 2015 when the Irish Data Protection Authority asked the Court of Justice in European, in European Union were, whether the, the safe harbor arrangement whereby companies could send information across, to, across the pond to the US uh, was valid. And the Court of Justice said the, that arrangement was invalid. Obviously, things have changed and moved on since then, and the privacy shield for those who are aware has come into force. But that doesn't mean that's, that's the solution or panacea, because as s s those who follow the, the news may be aware, uh, we are in constant discussion with the, the US and things are still unresolved and we're still un unclear whether um, transferring data over, over, um, over border to the US is, is, a, is a safe place to go. But what I want to say is that all the above shows that in the age of uh, borderless data flows, there's never been a more important for, uh, time for global currents in data protection and privacy. The, the divergent regulatory approach results in sometimes an even level of protection between jurisdictions, which leads to the need for legal control over cross-border flows. Um, and this is in order to prevent the, the law of the more protective regime to be circumvented or, and the privacy of the rights to be eroded. But globally as well, there's a, a recognition that there should be some law re regarding those uh, cross-border transfers. Um, and there's a, a wide variety of approach to this issue, uh, notably on, in relation to exemptions. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no single model or no silver bullet for managing that. On the contrary, there are numerous regional or international initiatives, some of which I will uh, speak to a bit more later on, if I have the time. Uh, but even though those, those diversion, divergence exists, uh, we see a number of jurisdictions uh, with data protection, um, protection or privacy legislation growing year on year. Uh, we can take a, a positive from the fact that uh, there's quite a lot of common ground in terms of underlying principles um, and a broad agreement in, in the concern that uh, all this should be addressed. Uh, for instance, in terms of underlying principle um, and those directly relate to the GDPR, you see a sort of openness, like organizations must be open to about uh, or they, um, they use uh, and process personal data. There should be some collection limitations, so you not, can just not just grab all the data you want. You need, data need to be limited lawful, fair, uh, and obviously with the consent of the user um, or use other uh, legal ground to do so. It must be uh, the, purpose, the, purpose, sorry, the purpose needs to be specified, uh, the use needs to be limited. Uh, obviously you need to have some safeguards, you know you're going to um, um, contain that data. Um, and then you need to have some, um, be able to provide access uh, to, uh, to the individual of, of their data. So those are the, the, the rights that in, are enshrined in the GDPR. And then one of the last principles about accountability. So um, how do you make sure that controllers are, are responsible for the, the way they've handled the, the information? And one last one, which I think is, is key to, um, to the future of the internet governance as well, is data portability. So to, how to ensure that whenever you go to a supplier, you can change without too much, too much trouble. Um, well, as I, as I say, there's, there's sort of no perfect way to regulate um, or legislate those different approaches. Um, so what is key is sort of uh, the concept of interoperability or as Robert mentioned, sort of that dialogue between the different uh, operating systems. Um, for instance, you have core principles that are enshrined in Convention 108, which sort of a, is, is sort of a, a new convention, I mean it's an old convention and has been modernized recently. Uh, and all uh, parties in Europe and, and uh, beyond Europe can sign up to. It's one, the, one of the only binding agreement that exists on data protection, so it's one which is really relevant for all those uh, beyond Europe who look at um, enabling uh, their economies to, to grow by using uh, transfer of data. Uh, then you have other systems like APEC, like in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, they also have established a, a privacy framework. You have also the OECD doing the same and then GDPR. Um, um, Alan, I, um, I, I know I gave you 50, 15 yeah. minutes to discuss, but um, I think we should be trying to talk about yeah. maybe what's a good overview, okay. some of the practicalities of how, how the Commonwealth can, mm -hmm. can, can improve capacity yeah. in this particular area. And one of the things that you have experience of is the Commonwealth Thread Network. So I wonder whether you could just give a, a quick overview of that um, and, uh, and talk about 
who's involved and, um, and what, what can be done in that area? Yeah, sure. So, um, as you know, the Commonwealth is about 53 um, jurisdiction. Um, at the moment, um, about 30 jurisdiction of data protection in, in the legislation. Uh, so it means that a large portion still don't have uh, data protection. Um, and all of, of those 30 who have uh, data protection, some don't have a data protection commissioner or somebody, an oversight body to enforce the legislation. So what we do within the uh, Common Thread Network, it's a, it's, it's a network that started in 2014 under the aegis of uh, Canada and the UK, mm -hmm. uh, was to group all those data protection authorities and privacy authorities and find common ways, commonalities, and, and trends, things we can discuss together. Because obviously, um, that dialogue that exists at international level also need to exist at sort of regional level. Um, and what we also try to do is just um, grab all those states that don't have at the moment a uh, data protection framework and say, well, why don't you join us and see from yourself? Uh, and obviously, it's sometimes difficult to grab the right person. Mm -hmm. um, because when you when you look at uh, across the Commonwealth and you look at the different ministries who have responsibility for data protection or cyber security, it varies. Okay. Uh, so, so just find the right person and, and speak about the, the benefit of having a data protection framework and having a strong data protection framework by which they can enhance and, and grow the, the, the economy. So that discussion is about that generally. Um, we all uh, regular meetings. Um, obviously, we participate into initiatives like the uh, the, the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization Initiative. Um, and we also very um, attentive to what the, um, the Commonwealth head of government meetings are doing. So for those who are not aware, head of, head of uh, governments in the Commonwealth meet every second year uh, in different places. So last, uh, last April was in, in London and they issued a declaration on cybersecurity, which was very important because they looked at or to um, overcome the, those regulatory barriers that exist and, and raise those common standards, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and there was also another uh, declaration that they issued on the connectivity uh, agenda for trade and investment. Okay. Again, it's about showing the different co Commonwealth jurisdiction that there's a gain in having strong data protection standards, so um, removing those regulatory barriers that exist so that you can uh, have that dialogue. So in the UK, you feel that there's enough in terms of regulation, uh, you feel that it's effective uh, in dealing with lots of the issues that arise in terms of data breaches, um, but the Commonwealth can be doing a lot more as a, ge as a, as a general rule, uh, uh, area. Region. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think um, implementing a new data protection regime is, is, is sometime, something that, that takes a long time. I mean, I'm sure that uh, yeah. when I can speak a long time uh, yeah. about that. Um, but in, in terms of the Commonwealth, I think we're getting there. There's a, as a, I think those, those dialogue that you, uh, that you instill um, uh, also means that when you get to the, the table, people realize that that's the benefit to gain here. Okay. Um, and so the, the longer you stay at the table and the, the more you go at those, at those meetings, the, uh, the more you can make your point. Yes. Okay, so uh, that, thank you very much uh, for your contribution. I'll come back to you later. Mono, uh, could you uh, talk about your experiences as a, a legal of a professor of, of law and um, your, your area of expertise is data protection. So if you could just talk about the, the work that you've um, kind of carried out and, and how it could potentially overarch into the Commonwealth countries. Sorry, um, so you need to talk about the work that you've um, okay. carried out and how, how you feel that it, you could give advice to Commonwealth countries that are present in this room. So um, our work uh, was mainly about uh, raising a little bit awareness mm -hmm. in the society. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I have to do this. Well, okay. Um, uh, society means um, citizens, ordinary people, laymen, and uh, later on, uh, all those who are involved in processing uh, personal data. Um, 
those uh, latter are not uh, interested in uh, data protection as um, um, rights as um, an element to protect human rights or other liberties, but as um, a, uh, let's say, an element of uh, that can uh, make them more competitive and uh, that can help them uh, protect their reputation uh, and uh, be uh, more, uh, let's say, um, efficient as in this digital economy, because um, when uh, or when uh, individuals or whoever uh, trusts you and trusts that uh, you are protecting uh, their data, then they will go for uh, work with you and uh, they won't hesitate to give uh, their own data. So um, what we did is that uh, we um, supported a uh, legislation, a project of, uh, of law, and uh, then when it was uh, out three weeks ago, uh, we found that uh, what we proposed wasn't there. Our proposition was uh, the creation of an authority uh, of protection uh, mainly of uh, informatics and liberties, we uh, took this model of the French uh, CNIL, uh, not because our system is built on the French uh, civil law, but because also we have many uh, concepts and principles in our constitutions that can support this proposal. and. Uh, the main objective was because we believe that if we were to uh, to be implicated or to be to benefit from the information society, then we have to uh, find the most safe and trustful and uh, um, way to do it. Okay. So, um, if you were going to make any recommendations, policy recommendations. Um, uh, or, or legal recommendations in terms of changing constitutions, how would you, what would you recommend to a country that hasn't got a, 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 a legal framework in, to deal with data protection? Yeah, I, uh, I, will, I would say that uh, harmonization of legislation in this field is a must. Uh, I heard him uh, talking about uh, uh, tens of jurisdiction at the uh, Commonwealth, but I think that uh, legislation in this field of personal data protection uh, has to be harmonized because uh, we are talking about a new world. Uh, so the, the, the jurisdiction, no, no, finally it's the same challenges. They are, uh, we have the same challenges, we have the same, um, uh, let's say, uh, some fears. Uh, we have uh, also uh, all uh, this uh, interest in being a part of this development, of this digital development. So for the same problems, we have to uh, fetch, to look for, if not the same solution, at least for the solution that can meet and they that cannot or uh, uh, should not go in <coughs> conflict. So it's getting on the political agenda is really the way of overcoming the obstacles to then change the policies and the legislation around data protection in, in a country that hasn't got it established. Is that, is that really what you're trying? Awareness um, is, is... Oh, awareness is a very important part of it. Okay. And uh, awareness and uh, cooperation at the national level, first of all, I mean, uh, all um, those, the multi-stakeholders, what? The, the people who are concerned by the protection of the data uh, should work together. Mm -hmm. And then later on, we need cooperation, I mean, here at the national level between the private and public sectors, because the two of them are concerned. And then later on, uh, with uh, between countries, mm -hmm. different countries, uh, they need to cooperate. Cooperation is a must. Since data travel and go over borders, we cannot talk about something uh, national and uh, specific for a uh, country. Okay. That's what. That's my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Now.
I'm going to pass it over to um, Sully and Etta now, actually. I, if I can come to you, leave you last, if that's okay, because I think that we're building in on the capacity development of, of, and, and looking at uh, data protection. And, and um, yeah, Sully and Etta, what are you doing in Fiji um, in terms of data protection, and what are you doing in, in, the, in the Pacific region? Um, and how, who's helping, um, and do you need more help? Thank, <coughs> thank you. Um, Salah, Sal for the record, Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, Salah, yeah. thanks, though. Just, to, just to make it easy. All right, yeah. So I thought I'd just set a bit of context. So uh, Fiji has a constitution, and we have two articles which canvas uh, privacy and uh, access to information. And uh, so the constitutional framework gives uh, legitimacy uh, in terms of uh, the creation of any instruments to do with uh, data protection. Now, in terms of having... Um, a generic data protection framework in Fiji. We do not have like a generic one. However, uh, different industries uh, diverse across um, Fiji, whether it's aviation, banking, are subjected to different regulations and legislative instruments, which some uh, which uh, have provisions that protect uh, to certain uh, to certain extent. Uh, customer information or patient information in the case of uh, uh, the health industry, for example. And as you can imagine, uh, living in a global borderless world, uh, we have things like geospatial information. And uh, a lot of that data is sensitive and doesn't necessarily um, get cached uh, within a country. And that's also true for the rest of the Pacific. Sometimes it's cached offshore. Now, if you look at Germany, for instance, there was an, I remember when I was doing summer school in Meissen, um, Google, I was trying to look for Google Earth to look for certain, you know, to, to look at where I was going to be accommodated. And I noticed uh, very quickly that, you know, houses were not part of it. Now, that's because of the extensive privacy framework. And as already canvassed by the first uh, panelist, who said that in Asia Pacific, we have the, the APEC privacy framework is right, and we also have the APEC border, uh, you know. Uh, uh, let me have a look, one second. I'm a bit jet lagged. Give me a second. Yeah, where we have, um, where we have the, what do you call it, um, principles, more or less. Now having said that, we also have, Fiji also is a party and has ratified the ICCPR. And um, Article 17 of the ICCPR neatly canvases uh, rights to privacy. And of course, that's, I've already mentioned that it's uh, also within uh, the Constitution. Now, in terms of de-anonymization of data, like the capacity for uh, uh, information to be tracked back to customers or to patients or that sort of thing. Now, that's something that is an issue, like because of the diversity of the Internet ecosystem and the diversity of cr uh, plethora of industries. Uh, which deal with uh, diverse uh, data, um, there are different, again, different legislative instruments that deal with certain aspects. So, for example, telecommunications. We have the Telecommunications Promulgations Decree, which has specific provisions forbidding the, um, you know, access unless you have, like, appropriate court orders, similarly with uh, any um, uh, enforcement orders that come in requesting data. Having said that, uh, you have like uh, things like census, or even um, I think one maybe I should mention a scan, a recent scandal, which was uh, birth and data records, <laughs> birth and data records, and so it's been rumored and it's been said that there have been certain. Uh, in fact, there's investigations currently in Fiji. I'm not sure if I can comment on it, but I suppose I'll just comment anyway because we're having elections tomorrow, so I'm not in trouble. Um, not that it matters. <laughs> but um, there have been certain uh, birth records that have been duplicated and sold uh, to Pakistani nationals uh, um, for, I think it was purported to have been sold for like 10,000. Uh, so that people could get passports. So you have like a birth and data regi uh, registration for a specific individual, um, you know, and some multiple identities. So things like that. And then the other thing I, want, I wanted to very quickly cross over because you mentioned the GDPR and just to uh, see how the linkages and the nexus within uh, nexus with uh, Pacific Island uh, countries. Now, if you look at, uh, take for example, the financial industry, tell me if I'm out of time. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Yes. 
And if you look at the financial industry, for example, um, uh, you've got um, uh, you know backend platform providers and vendors. And if you if you see a lot of the companies that are listed in the London Stock Exchange, um, a lot of them are you know like global submarine cable providers, satellite providers, for example, the International Marine Organization, or IMO, I was just having a joke with, sharing a joke with, sorry, turn it off. Yes, with uh, Miguel from Paraguay about flags of convenience, that's another story. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, we covered a lot there, um, and there's a lot to cover, and I'm not sure, sure we're going to do it in an hour, so if I can pass over to Mary, um, Mary, can you just t tell us about the Nigerian example and how you manage data breaches, uh, data <laughs> privacy, uh, okay. data protection, um, and what recommendations do you have? Thank you. I'll just go straight to the point okay. and raise all the points. Okay. Now, in Nigeria, we have uh, the cyber security law. Okay. But it did not talk about data protection. Okay. So there's nothing like data protection. But what, has, what have, we have started doing is that the Senate at the, the National Assembly, they, they, they just started what we call expert group, group working group, expert working group okay. on GDPR okay. to advise the, gov the, the lawmakers because they, if they are going to pass any law on data protection, so they need that. And uh, so there's a, a, a group. They've held one open meeting okay. where some of us attended and um, then there, there was partnership from EU that came and they had a retreat. I don't know the outcome of the retreat as we speak. And um, there's an a, a ongoing survey. Well, the Oxford uh, University uh, Consultancy is doing with uh, the Office of National Security Advisor. Um, they are talking to several sec sectors of the economy or, 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 or of the ICT industry. So some of us were invited and interviewed. Okay. Then the regulator has a dedicated, the telecom regulator has a dedicated cyber, I mean, new, new media and information security. So they are focusing on in information security. Fortunately, the director is here, but nothing has started on data protection. And a lot of capacity, we, we, we don't have the, the capabilities we don't have the capacity, and so we, we need to build the experts. We need to create awareness. We need a lot of help in that area. So okay. awareness creation, uh, capacity building, and then um, writing of the legislation and all the rest of them, they, we don't have it yet. So all those are the areas we need uh, help. Uh, one other thing is that our CCTLD, Mm -hmm. has gone ahead to look at how the GDPR would affect our, the registrars as well as the registrant of the .ng uh, mm -hmm. domain name. So, and they, they've come up with a statement is published on their website and they, you know, that is the much we have done. So we still need to build a lot of capacity. We need to advise the government we need good advisors for the government. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, Alan, do you, would you like to respond to anything that you've heard uh, and, 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 and potentially give your own experiences in terms of what's going on in the Commonwealth Common Thread Network and, and how you potentially could offer support, support or how support could be provided to these yeah. countries? Um, yeah, very briefly from, from our experience, we. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because we, we welcome a representative from Nigeria a few months back, but that, that sort of was just one meeting and never, never think, uh, nothing came out of that, so it's interesting. But um, we also have advised Ghana recently uh, on their legislation, and so I think that I've progressed that well and they've implemented legislation. They have a, a very active data protection commission um, who's active on the continent in Africa and is working with other counterparts because, well, we have the common thread network and I make the, well, I mean, the eulogy of the Common Thread Network, but you have other networks that exist in, in Africa, which has uh, recently been established as an, um, a regional uh, network as well for the Francophone and the um, Anglo-Saxon authorities. And it's, it's great that they work together um, because the, the, the language bar is sometimes ultimately what 
convince people not to work together. But here, in that sense, they have established that they could work all together and have a, have a, have a joint um, uh, leadership. Uh, so from my experience, I think that that works well when you sort of uh, try and instill that. Um, and I'll respond so to you. So you mentioned, uh, can I ask a very naive question? You mentioned that um, 30 countries have data protection legislation and Commonwealth for data, but then only, what, a handful have, uh, or maybe two hands full have, have um, commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, is there, do you see value in, 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 in the UK? How, how is, uh, should, should, is, is that the right way of going about data protection um, uh, uh, governance? Um, for every country, not every country, you know, some countries are very small, uh, right. some countries are very large. So, you know, like Nigeria, very large population, but, you know, there's certainly a need, I would imagine, for a commissioner to, to take on that regulation, you know, process. But not every country has that model. So what's your re recommendation there? Well, whatever, whatever model you, you, you impose, you need to, having, having a regulation without somebody to oversee that regulation has no meaning, no purpose at all. Um, I mean, it's like any sector. If you want to, I mean, you could be pricing issues. You need somebody to enforce that legislation. Otherwise, it adds no meaning at all. Okay. Um, so the, whatever the model is chosen, uh, an ombudsman, a commissioner, uh, a defender, um, they should have some, some, some powers to uh, legislate. Okay, anything. right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I can I pass over to, to Eleanor and uh, to Teresa to, to make some um, comments on ICANN and what you're doing in terms of GDPR. So, I'm gonna, um, I'll, I'll kick it off and then I'm actually going to hand it over to Elena um, more on the specifics uh, for ICANN and GDPR. Just a couple observations from the conversation here, and I think this is something that um, that we're really starting to see also from, from ICANN's perspective. Um, is that it's the emergence of um, legisl legislation and regulations that are very well intended, um, cybersecurity, data protection, um, issues that really need to be dealt with. Um, and once you apply those to the technological environment and ICT, um, you oftentimes see unintended consequences or unintended results out of it. Um, potentially a patchwork of legislation in different countries, whether within the Commonwealth or between uh, the Commonwealth countries and um, the European Union, it, it doesn't really matter where it is, um, that may have an impact on the ability for transborder commerce uh, or economic growth or uh, societal uh, matters that are being dealt with either at the national or the regional level. level. And um, so this is, it, this is something that I think is um, an opportunity for experts to help inform uh, the establishment of regulations and legislation that are well intended, but find ways to do them so that they're scalable and don't have a, a harmful aspect to the, the social and economic growth that ICT and technology and the internet offers uh, to all parts of the world. And, um, so this is sort of more of a general observation that I think we're going to continue seeing over time. Um, if we look uh, specifically um, around uh, ICANN, and, and this is a very specific example of, uh, you know, the European data protection um, legislation, so the GDPR is very well intended. Um, it's, um, you know, the intention is really to allow your personally identifiable information to be protected, and, and that's an important aspect in today's world. You take that then to the next level of, of ICANN where we have um, uh, what is called uh, the who is information, which you know very well when you register a domain name, you provide that information. And that information historically had been intended to be able to find the party who might have another name in order to solve maybe an issue between those two parties and allow them to solve that together. Now. Going through time, that who is information has become quite important um, in the domain name system. And um, as we went into looking at the applicability uh, of GDPR in relation to um, ICANN specifically and the use of who is in relation to the contracted parties we had, not the CCTLDs because we don't have them under contract, but we do have it under um, the generic space. We had to work through a process to see how to make modifications to the contracts to be compliant. So traditionally available 
uh, information to the public with the registrant's option to have it private um, really had to have now a, a segment of that who is information, the personally identifiable part, uh, that was made private and the rest of it public. Uh, so we uh, went through an iterative process with the community um, and uh, through consultation documents and materials um, established uh, what was referred to as the Calzone model, uh, trying to solve many different issues. Uh, and that resulted in the adoption in May of what is a temporary specification, which is a modification to our contracts, which for the first time made a requirement that there's publicly available information and non-publicly available information. Uh, so that then raises the question uh, for all the stakeholders who still want to get access to who is, whether it's law enforcement for cybersecurity related reasons, um, intellectual property users. Um, maybe I would like to know um, whether an email that was sent to me really came from the person who it says it sent it, or whether the news article is actually from a, a source that is really the newspaper that claims it's coming from. Um, how do we enable that to be possible um, under now this new system? Uh, so we've been working um, with a range of areas, um, including uh, trying to determine whether it's possible to have uh, a, a unified mechanism uh, to determine that, but one that is um, scalable on a global level while meeting the requirements of the GDPR. Um, but with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague who's dealing more with the specifics of the European part that might help inform some of the discussions yes. here by May. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of details. Was, uh, I, we can talk about this forever, <laughs> like, and for other issues as well. Um, just uh, to, to mention briefly, after the reason, the, the who is database, which is very specific to ICANN, is not the only database that has some relevance to the technical underpinnings of the internet. There are other databases which are not so prominent in the discussion because there's not so much noise an, around it. And they might as well be affected. So again, the, the message is when legislation is delivered, it's, it's, um, it's um, developed, uh, this part, the technical community should be part of this discussion. We, we plea you to make us part of the discussion, and we're also there and available. Uh, I am based in the Brussels office of uh, ICANN, so I have uh, a lot of exchange with the European DPAs and the European member states trying to to mitigate, to, to tackle this issue. And uh, it, you might have noticed that the DPAs, uh, the European DPAs at least, have issued guidance to ICANN and have issued uh, a statement about our issue. And this is quite, I would say, uh, not, um, it's not the easiest past thing in the world. They are very, very busy. They haven't issued guide, uh, guidance with other sectors that are huge, but still they, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they did that for the quiz and for ICANN. And that's a recognition of the, of the fact that this is a significant, significant uh, thing to think of the technical underpinning. So um, I paid a visit to the Turkish DPA because they wanted to discuss the, the issue. And I mean, how the data privacy legislation might have an effect on technical underpinnings. And we're willing to continue discussing. Please include us in the discussion. And I have yeah. to, just one point uh, I will take from you, from Mona. Mona said cooperation is necessary. That's, I totally agree. Because so imagine if we develop uh, different things around the world. And it's yeah. Excuse me. Uh, yes, uh, uh, actually, what, whatever legislation or regulation that is uh, intended to touch technology or whatever of our uh, daily life that is connected to technology needs this cooperation because even uh, uh, legislators uh, don't un necessarily um, understand what is to be regulated or to be organized. But l let me first um, give you some answers to what you were uh, talking about. I think that um, According to the GDPR, there are, there are some exemptions because the nature of the uh, organization's work or uh, whoever uh, institution uh, that is um, um, related, directly related to the management of uh, personal data, uh, 
uh, when this institution, uh, institution needs this data to verify operations or to prove or to defend some interests, then uh, here the rules are different because actually the main objective of the GDPR, actually this morning we had the meeting with the president of the CNIL and uh, uh, we were, she, she were uh, talking about this actually, because the main objectives of the GDPR is to give these individuals uh, a kind of control on their own data which represents the assets of digital economy. And uh, when another, uh, another objective is to help the development of <coughs> digital economy. So if this will harm other uh, whatever uh, sectors involved, uh, it won't work. And as an example, take the uh, financial institution. And uh, here you can see that they have their own way of protecting their personal data and of uh, using this data and also of, um, let's say, um, keeping this data for more uh, period, for a longer period of time. While, uh, I mean, uh, they don't have, for example, to delete the data after an operation with a, a given client is finished because maybe in the future they will have to go back to this and prove something. The police, the law enforcement, whoever doesn't have, uh, don't have to be treated like uh, usual or whoever individual or institution. You see, they, they are, they have especially they can be seen uh, differently by the GDPR. Thank you, Mona. Um, GDPR compliance is, is, is something that it's going to be a challenge for a lot of organizations. Uh, and um, I mean, there's a, a sort of a honeymoon period, isn't there, is such that... Um, it's over. <laughs> uh, is it over already? Is, is, there, is there no sort of leniency in, in for, for, for businesses and uh, organizations in, in the transition? Because, yes, yeah, yeah, everybody has to... But in terms of data management, the best, pra best practices and uh, containing data, there are a lot of organizations that surely aren't uh, not complying if you actually went and audited their management of data. So how, how is auditing of data, um, because how is that going to be managed by, it, 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 how can that be managed by organizations? It's a, it's, a, a, it's a very big mountain to climb in some respects. Um, we're talking about data protection and the, the GDPR, and those that are affected Organization, technical organization like the ICANN, or as you have explained, we have the Facebook of this world, we have the Google, those that collect our data. And if each country establishes its own, will Google sign <laughs> agreement with all of them? Or is it better to have a standard one that everybody would have cooperated and agreed upon, and when they sign that one, it affects everybody? I mean, it affects, it, it, it covers for or every country, I don't know. Uh, well, Doug, to respond to your question narrowly, um, you might remember that there was a case against Facebook in, before the GDPR came into force, that was back in 2015, and then, GDPR, well, you had different jurisdictions going to, to Facebook, and then Facebook signing up to different arrangements with those different jurisdictions. So I would agree that, yes, when you have regional agreement or interoperable agreement, and by which a company can assert exactly what their rights are and their obligation, I think that would be preferable in terms of, of business. I think that the no's will, will be there. Um, in, Mona, you, you reflect on the fact that there's some uh, justification for to keeping all of data. Yes, there are. So if you, it's in legitimate interest to keep your data, yes. And there are, there are different issues like uh, money laundering. There's a good reason for banks to keep your data. Um, the payment services directive uh, number two, which exists since, uh, since the beginning of the year, also permit agencies to, uh, different agents in the, in the financial market to keep all of your data. So there are different, um, and obviously one of the um, reason you can you can pro process data is the legitimate interest you have, and I guess ICANN in, the, in that sense use, use that. And you have also contract, which is another basis for, a legal uh, basis for, for processing data. Um, but to respond to your question, Robert, yes, I think the, uh, the, the honeymoon period is, is over already. 
um, because what we, what we took on board is that uh, the GDPR was adopted back in 2016, mm -hmm. and then the, the co companies and businesses had two years to implement their processes. So they were um, provided, for instance, they, um, if they had to um, um, appoint a data protection officer, which was a new uh, part of the GDPR, well, they had two years to con consider that aspect. Okay. Um, and then make, make sure that the, the, the point I made about accountability is an important one. Because in the past, under the directive, you, you, you were, well, for instance, you, you suffered a breach and then you had to, t to tell the regulator what happened. And then you had to justify what action you had taken after the breach occurred. With the GDPR, it's a bit different. You have to tell the, the regulator what have you done in the past. Um, and that response is obviously slightly different from what happened during, under the directive um, uh, framework. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah, but, but, uh, but there's one thing, and, and sorry, I should probably know the answer. Um, the, the, I, I wanted to talk about the commercialization of data. You've talked about commercialization and, and, and companies and can be held to account, but somebody, somebody that's, you know, I don't know, breaching uh, of data for, uh, let's say, whether they're working for a charitable organization or they're working, with, uh, I, I don't know, in some sort of um, a, a role which is uh, for good intentions but not money making. How are they th therefore restricted by data, the data laws? Yes, I wanted to comment on uh, commercialization. Like, if you look at the 2016 global uh, e-commerce sales was 1.92 trillion, uh, and B2C globally in 2016, as per the APEC uh, officials meeting, global sales, global e-commerce sales was 1.9 trillion. We're 1 trillion USD though. 1 trillion of those was from Asia, Asia PAC, and then 0 0.9 was the rest of the world. So you, when you're talking about motivations, because when you're legislating or you're thinking about legislating, uh, you look at jurisprudence and you look at motivations. And the motivations of uh, the data is the monetization and commercialization. How valuable is that data? Now in terms of on-selling to third parties, that's where we have a problem, like I'm from civil society. For instance, the recent data breach with Facebook, the Cambridge uh, Analytica, where Zuckerberg apologized. And then you have Macron saying, okay, look, we are going to take the approach of talking to a, a private sector and private sector is uh, taking ownership to say, look, we're self-regulating and here's, here are our best standards. And you've got instances where they've said, look, we've got the tech accord. So how far do we want to go? And, uh, but I would uh, just uh, conclude to say that because I've got to go pick up my luggage. To say, <laughs> yes, I'll just conclude to say that we need capacity building in this space in small island developing states. Yeah. Very, very quickly, just to comment uh, on the... We're sitting on this table, I think, because we're quite unique in the sense that ICANN is an organization that is providing a service to the world. We do not even have the database. We don't have commercial use of the database. So all these things are kind of... We're in a gray zone of this law that was created... I'll, I'll, tell, I'll explain why. The police. Yeah, of course, there's a police directive. They're not even under the GDPR. Uh, the exemptions are there for, this law was made for commercial companies taking advantage or not, or good, doing good use of the data of citizens. Huh? We are putting the, this data in the use of the technical thing of the internet. It's not that straightforward. Not straightforward at all. Uh, and we I, do not even have the data. Oh, sorry, sorry have Mona. Can I I'll ask if there's any questions from the floor? Sorry, because I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, Ian Brown from the UK Government Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Um, harmonisation absolutely is important, um, and I think uh, something else that it's well worth common Commonwealth states and others looking at um, as model law is the Council of Europe's Data Protection Convention um, 108, which is open to ratification by non-members of the Council of Europe. And just looking at the list of current non-member uh, non signatories, there are a number such as Cabo Verde, Mauritius, Morocco, Senegal, Tunisia, Uruguay, so that's something to explore. And it's only a third of the length of the GDPR, so not quite such a burden for states to implement. Sorry, just to add to that, I'm also from uh, UK government, but I think as well this harmonization debate, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, Nicole Gregory, sorry. Okay. 
<laughs> um, which I think is also quite interesting around uh, based on principles as opposed to necessarily equivalent, as, you know, essential equivalence or, or whatever kind of language you might use, because which I think is, is coming out through the Council of Europe as well. It's around actually what are the core principles of data protection that we should be looking at, which then you have to put into a local context, Excellent. but actually then does provide potentially for a level of interoperability between different countries. So oversight being one, without dictating what exactly that looks like, but some kind of independent oversight. And it could be a different kind of model depending on your local circumstances. So to me, I think the idea of looking at this from a principal point of view, as opposed to an essential equivalence point of view is quite important. Absolutely. High five. Yeah, my, my name is uh, Wisdom. Uh, I'm a MAG member. <coughs> um, I, I'm from Ghana, yes. Uh, I'm looking at uh, Africa. I'm, I'm speaking uh, in regards to Africa. And an example, Ghana. Uh, in 2015, you know, Ghana, we started this, uh, our national open data uh, initiative. And then uh, along the line, we're having so many issues uh, in regards to uh, data protection uh, and all that. So we actually find a need uh, to have one. So in 2012, uh, Ghana uh, enacted uh, the open, open uh, data, uh, data protection law and all that to guide businesses, uh, individual, everyone. But then there were so many issues, and then one of them uh, was uh, education. Because people are not aware, even the, the lawyers, the judges, and all that, are not aware of this uh, data protection laws, even uh, our education, educational sectors and all that. So more often you see uh, people's certificates flying on the streets and, 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 and all that. So I think uh, with the context of Africa, the issues are there. And then number, the, number one of it is sort of education and then uh, political uh, commitment. Uh, it looks like our politicians are also uh, kind of, uh, I, I don't know the word to use, but then they are afraid, kind of, we we'll use it against them. Thank you, Winston. That. Um, that was a, a very good um, addition to the discussion. I think that uh, way forward, um, I think one of the things the CTO could do is potentially uh, have a working group of members that can help member countries get a better understanding of what the issues are and, 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 how, and build capacity in that area because I think there's still a lot uh, that needs to be uh, done in this area. I mean, uh, um, somebody with the for the CTO knows that. Um, and, and, and Alan, do you have anything else to, to, to contribute um, as a closing statement? Um, It might not be a closing statement, but with reference to what you said about uh, scalability, um, I think you, should, you could refer to uh, an UNCTAD report published in 2016 about inter international data uh, transfer. So because also, they also mentioned the fact that, yes, you, you, whatever system you come up with, they, they need to be something to oversee your regulation. Uh, they need to work about data trans international transfer, what it means for you as well. Surveillance and internet, what it means as well for you. So in surveillance and data protection, what it means for you. So those different sort of snippets of information need to be in your legislative framework before you envisage going forward with, um, with um, well, overlooking that information. Well, I'd like to thank everybody. Oh, we've got one more. Is yes, quick uh, statement. Just a comment. Can um, I my name is. Uh, can you Mr. just introduce yourself, please? Sorry. Could okay. My name is uh, Haru Al Hassan. I'm the director of New Media and Information Security in Nigerian Communication Commission. Uh, I just need to add uh, some little things. Um, uh, in addition to what Mrs. Uduma said, we collaborated with CTO um, uh, successfully on the cyber security issue when they come to Nigeria and uh, taught on cyber, uh, cyber security essentials, and uh, we are doing it now. And I hope we will also collaborate on the issue of data protection regulation in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. Yes. That's a welcome uh, comment. Yes, we've done a lot with cybersecurity and, uh, um, and development in terms of building capacity in lots of Commonwealth member countries. So we're hoping that we can work again 
with partners to also provide um, uh, this, 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 this um, in, in the data protection field as well. But thank you very much to everybody uh, for coming and staying through the hour. And thank you very much for my, to the speakers that have participated. Can I also ask the speakers just quickly if we can just grab a photo outside, just, a, just a, so we, we've got something to put in our um, e-Commonwealth magazine. Um, so, Cypher, can you just grab and take, take a photo of us? Is that, is that all right? Thank you. Thank you so much.